right while it's in my mind. Um, again, I'm hoping that we, even the few of us that gather on, on when, uh, Sunday evenings to study apologetics, I hope that we get fully saturated with it and have as best, as good an understanding as we possibly can. But what R.C. is going to do is he's first going to show us how to prove, basically, uh, how would you say it, uh, with 100% certainty that God exists. And he, he believes it's important, and I think he's right, to prove that there is a God that exists before we begin to try to prove the Bible is the Word of God and not start with the Bible. Because if there's no God, there, there's not going to be any miracles, and miracles are going to be the way. It is the way that God actually proves the Bible is His Word. So we start with God, and then we move to these miracles. If there's no God, there's no miracles. But if there is a God, how does this God reveal His message to mankind? Well, He does it by doing something only God can do, and that is the miracle. And that's, again, the power of the miracle as we see it in our text this morning. But let's begin by reading uh, Acts chapter 9, verses 32 through 43. Now, as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. Immediately he got up. And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened that at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. Well, it's always, um, you know, it's always interesting to read about miracles. They're always encouraging. And the thing that we need to realize, of course, is these things really took place, you know, back in those days. This is not... The fabrication of someone pulling the wool over our eyes, trying to make us believe something that didn't happen. This is a record of what actually did take place. God does miracles, and He does it again to confirm His Word, to arrest attention and to confirm His Word. Now, last time we saw Luke uh, focusing on the conversion of the one that the Lord had called to be His apostle to the Gentiles, and that was the Pharisee Saul. Now, Saul, up to this point, as he tells us in Philippians 3, where he gives us a little bit of his um, biography, had a very high opinion of himself. He saw himself as the Hebrew of Hebrews, that is, the Hebrew above all Hebrews, a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was the one who stood, as it were, head and shoulders above the rest, the one who was the most zealous for God. He was so zealous, he was even willing to travel to foreign lands in order to stamp out this heresy, those who proclaim Jesus to be the Christ. But as we know, our Lord Jesus Christ sort of knocked him down a few notches. He showed him who he really was, not the friend of God, not the champion of God, but rather God's enemies. God's, okay. On his way to Damascus, the Lord humbled him and blinded him, and in his blindness, uh, he fasted and sought the Lord, and the Lord in His mercy saved him. Now, one thing we noted about Saul, and this is something that we believe will take place, perhaps not to the same degree, but will take place to some degree in everyone whose life is, con is converted by the Lord when the Holy Spirit comes in and makes us alive. His life changed immediately. It changed dramatically. He had come to Damascus to stamp out Christianity, to imprison Christians. 
But after the Lord changed his heart, he did his best to convert every Jew he could find into a Christian by preaching the very faith that he previously had tried to destroy. His ministry was, was, so, it was so public, it was so obvious, so powerful, so effective that it wasn't long before the, the Jews wanted to kill him, including the secular authorities. They were watching the gates day and night, so he had to flee, as we know, being let down uh, on, uh, through, a, through a window in a basket, fled to Jerusalem. And there his ministry was equally powerful so that very soon his own people, even those he used to basically close ranks with, the Hellenistic Jews you know, with which he argued against Stephen, even those Jews also wanted to kill him. So the brethren brought him, remember, into to the harbor at Caesarea, uh, the very Caesarea that Peter is going to be at uh, in, in the next chapter, uh, uh, preaching the gospel to Cornelius and his household and sent him back to his hometown of Tarsus. Now, Paul will later write to Timothy that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. They'll be persecuted by the world. They'll be persecuted by the world that is inside the church as well. That was certainly true in Paul's life. But we need to remember that's not all persecution. Uh, those, of course, who live godly in Christ Jesus will also be loved by the Lord and by the saints, and that was equally true in the life of Paul. Now, the change that the Lord brought about in Saul not only brought growth to the church, it continued to prosper throughout uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but it also brought peace. Uh, the persecutor of the brethren was now a brother in Christ. You know, you never know whom the Lord's going to save but when he saves, he does a thorough job. Now, this morning, Luke sh shifts his focus from Saul to, to Peter. Uh, one thing that's been noted about the book of Acts is that the book is primarily about two individuals, and really more primarily about one, isn't it? It's about Paul, his conversion and his missionary journeys, but it's also about Peter, and they're basically seen as the apostle to the Jews and the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, Peter has been called the apostle to the Jews, and certainly he was, but the Lord was also intending to use him to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, as I just noted, to Cornelius and his family. And that's the direction that the Lord now begins to move him as Peter goes out to visit and to strengthen the churches. We'll see if we trace his journey that he's actually heading towards Caesarea, where he's going to speak to Cornelius. Now, this morning, I want us to consider basically these two miracles we've just read about, the visit to the two cities, the two miracles that, that bring many people to faith. And then I want us to see some applications from this, but I want to intersperse the applications in, in these two points. I want us to see, again, the evidential power of miracles, the power of the Spirit in the believer's life, which is also evidential. And I want us to see the Lord's providential guidance of Peter as he's moving him towards Caesarea. Now, first of all, we see the healing of Aeneas, and we see its evidential power. After Peter returned to Jerusalem from Samaria, remember, that's basically where we left Peter. Uh, Peter had seen the work the Lord was doing through Philip as he was preaching the gospel to the Samaritans, and many of the Samaritans were being saved. Um, he came down with John because none of them had received the Holy Spirit, and you'll recall the Lord had an interest in tying all these early church plants to the church at Jerusalem until the word was complete and they had, uh, you know, a complete rule of faith and practice. Well, after he remained there for some time, he did return to Jerusalem and even though Saul's persecution scattered the disciples and they began proclaiming Christ everywhere they went, we read that the apostles remained in Jerusalem and so Peter remained there. But after a while, the Lord put it in his heart to visit the churches that had been established in Judea, uh, primarily by those that were scattered by the persecution and had gone about preaching Christ. Now, uh, we read in verse 32, now as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he came down also to the saints who lived at, at Lydda. Now, one thing I think we need to see is that at this particular time, these churches had not been established long enough for men to be recognized and ordained as elders. So it was the apostles' responsibility still to care for them. 
And even if there was local leadership, the apostles still had concern for the churches, and so they would visit them. Now, Lydda was northwest of Jerusalem. If, if let's say, you know, this is Palestine and Jerusalem is, you know, towards the south, Lydda is moving northwest then toward the coast, towards the plains next to the coast, on the way to Joppa, which is on the way to Caesarea. When he arrived, he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Now, sometimes, you know, we read about these individuals, we see some of the details of their lives, and we we don't really stop to think about just how difficult life would be for somebody like this. We can only imagine. It's hard to lose any of the abilities, any of the gifts that the Lord gives to us, whatever they may be such as the the gift of sight or the gift of hearing, the gift to be able to think clearly or to be able to remember what it is we hear so that we can do something with it later on. Well, it's difficult also to lose the ability to walk or even to move. You know, we're not really told here whether he was a paraplegic or a, a quadriplegic, but it's difficult even to be a paraplegic when you become completely dependent on others to meet your needs. So this must have been very difficult. Now, if we haven't gone through something like that, which most of us haven't, we just need to think about what it's like to get sick and maybe to be laid up for a week. You know, how difficult it is just just to go through that. Aeneas was bedridden for eight years. That's a very long time. And I think we would have to assume at this point he had given up any hope that he was ever going to recover. Now, the interesting thing is that this is the kind of person that the Lord often chooses to heal, isn't it? Those that are in a hopeless condition. As we look at the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, we note that that on one occasion, He healed a man who had been blind from birth. And I think it turns out that this man was over 40, so 40 years in darkness. On another occasion, the man who was sitting next to the water, remember when the water was stirred, that he had been sick for 38 years, basically incapacitated, hoping to be healed by the angel that stirs the waters in the pool. Uh, Peter and John earlier had healed a lame man who was sat next to the, remember the beautiful gate and to beg alms. He had been lame from birth. Now, It's likely that the Lord chooses to heal these people because they, more than anyone else, first of all, want it. They desire to be healed. You know, the Lord doesn't really heal anyone unless they really want to be healed. And, of course, He also looks for the faith that is necessary for them to receive this healing. But I think He also heals these kinds of hopeless cases because their healing has a greater potential to affect the people who see them, the people who know them. I mean, just think about the healing of Peter and John when they healed the lame man who had been lame from birth at the temple. People were seeing him every single day as they were coming to the temple. They had known him for years, and when they healed him, 5,000 people were converted on that occasion. So the Lord looks for cases like this in order to heal because of the evidential power more witnesses, more people who know Him, more people who can see and verify the miracle took place. Now, when Peter saw Him, he said, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately, he got up. Now, one thing I think is also interesting is the miracles that our Lord Jesus Christ does. Notice that they always benefit someone, don't they? They're always been, you know, there's always something good. Somebody gets something good. When he wants to prove that he's speaking God's word, he doesn't simply make the earthquake, you know, he doesn't knock down a building, he doesn't create a tornado, right? Those are miracles, right? But uh, rather, he gives sight to the blind. He gives hearing to the deaf, the ability to walk to the lame. He gives life to the dead. And the reason he does that is because he's showing us not only that God is speaking, but he's also showing us what he's like. God is full of mercy and compassion. And that's something we need to remember because that is the God that that we serve. And we see him reaching out in mercy and compassion to his people here. 
Now, Peter not only reached out to relieve this man's suffering, and again, it was really the Lord Jesus who did that. He made sure that everybody who saw that miracle, that they knew exactly who it was who did it. It wasn't me, you know, it wasn't Peter. It was Jesus, he says, the Christ. Now, I don't know if you've ever had the chance, and I couldn't, I couldn't help resist, you know, I couldn't resist giving this illustration, and I've, I've given it before, but if you've ever had the chance to watch those who call themselves faith healers on television, you'll notice that more often than not, they give the credit for the healing to themselves rather than to Jesus. Now, they do throw the, the word Jesus around. They have to give some credibility to what they're doing. But I think ultimately it boils down to them, their gift, their ministry. God has specially anointed them, and you need to give your money to them. I, I remember, I, you probably remember me telling you before, years ago I was at a pastor's conference at Jack Hayford's church, which, which is basically full gospel, what is it called, four square gospel uh, that was established by uh, Amy F uh, Simple McPherson. Um, it's, it's basically a Pentecostal church. And he invited Oral Roberts to be the speaker, uh, one of the keynote speakers. He had actually three at that particular occasion. It's the only one I ever went to. But Oral Roberts, as he was speaking about his ministry, held up his hands. And he says, these hands, these hands have been used by God to anoint and to touch and to heal many people. These hands. He, he spoke so much about his hands and his ministry. And really, very little was spoken about God and, and his ability at all. It was really focusing on Oral Roberts. And as I've said, many of these people do that. But I want you to notice that Paul, excuse me, in this case, Peter, did not do that. He gave the glory to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who heals this man. And he's the one you need to look to. Now, another difference between the miracles of Jesus and the miracles of the apostles and this miracle of Jesus is, and those of the faith, you know, the faith healers that they claim today was that this man actually was healed. There were those who saw it, and they, they knew that something supernatural had happened, and they believed. We read in verse 35, all who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. I told you about all the years that I was in the faith healing movement, and the only thing I ever saw during that time was people claiming to be healed. I never saw anything happen, and I doubt that anybody there ever saw anything happen that was supernatural didn't create any kind of an amazement. It was more of like, he says he has a warm feeling in his back. Was he really healed or not? In this case, here's a man who had been bedridden for eight years who gets up and takes up his bed and, and goes, you know. Obviously, he's, he's healed. So the evidential power of a real miracle, okay, that's what we need to see that true miracles bring. The people didn't stand around wondering whether something had taken place. They knew something had taken place. It was clearly an act of God. It stopped traffic, and it compelled those who saw it because of the fear in their hearts to think very seriously where they stood with the Lord. And because of that, many believed. Now, before we think about that any further, I want us to look at the second miracle, the raising of Tabitha from the dead. Now, Luke goes on and says, while Peter was at Lydda, a woman by the name of Tabitha who lived in Joppa, and by the way, this is the same Joppa that uh, Jonah booked passage to Tarshish, remember, when he was trying to run away from the Lord instead of going to preach in Nineveh. Well, this woman, Tabitha, became sick and she died. Now, Tabitha was her Aramaic name. Her Greek name was Dorcas. I noticed that not too many people choose that name for their daughters, Dorcas. But actually, it's, it, it, in Greek, it's, it has a very nice meaning. It means gazelle. It means, it means deer, you know, graceful creature that God has created. Now, I want us to notice something about Tabitha. I want us to notice something about what Luke says about her character, that she wasn't a Christian in name only, but she was a Christian also in deed. She was a woman who was known for her kindness, the charity that she showed towards the poor. When Peter comes in a little bit, the widows are going to show him all the clothing that she made to take care of them while she was still alive. Okay, we would say that Tabitha had what James called a living faith. It wasn't the dead faith, you know, where somebody just lays a claim to it, 
but a living faith because she was doing the very thing that James tells us somebody who has faith will do. He says in chapter 2 of, of, of his epistle, verses 15 through 18, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. He goes on to say, you know, show me your faith without, your, without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Well, Tabitha was simply showing that she truly believed in the Lord Jesus Christ because of her industrious activity in clothing these widows. Now, we saw how the Lord's grace had transformed Saul's life. Remember, he no longer wanted to destroy the church. Instead, he wanted to build the church. But his grace also transformed this woman so that she wanted to build the church from within, you know, by taking care of, of widows, something that was, that's very precious in God's eyes, something that he is very concerned about, whether or not widows are cared for. God's grace changes the life. So here's this woman, Tabitha, again, rich in good works. But something else we need to recognize is this, that no matter how much we love the Lord, no matter how much we serve the Lord and do His will, we see that death still comes to every one of us. It will eventually come to all of us because of the fall, regardless of how good a Christian, how faithful a Christian we are. And so it came to Tabitha. She became sick and she died. Now, the difference between, of course, this kind of death and a death that takes place in the world is that this is not altogether a bad thing. Remember what Paul said, given, given the choice, he would rather die than continue to live. And that's because Jesus has taken the sting out of death for the believer. Death is no longer a judgment for the believer, but it's a mercy. This is how our Lord takes us home. And Paul tells us that to leave this world and to go home to be with the Lord is so much better than remaining here, so much so that he would rather leave and go there. We shouldn't fear death, but we should welcome it. As a matter of fact, as we think about that, we kind of wonder whether the, these friends of Tabitha did her a favor or not. But um, anyway, certainly this was God's will in order to advance his kingdom. Now, Tabitha's friends didn't bury her right away. They prepared her body according to the custom, laid her in an upper room so that her family and friends could come and, and mourn her. But some of the disciples, some of the believers, heard that Peter was nearby in Lydda. The two towns are roughly 10 miles apart. So they sent two men to urge him to come. They had heard what the Lord had done through Peter for Aeneas and came hoping that he might allow Peter to raise Tabitha, even as the Lord Jesus had raised the, the son of the widow of Nain and how he had also raised his friend Lazarus. Now, when Peter heard their request, he, he immediately left with them. And that reminds us, you know, that uh, you never know when the opportunity is going to come to serve the Lord, so you need to be ready to go whenever he might call. And when he arrived, they led him to where Tabitha was lying and where the widows were mourning for her. Peter asked them all to leave, likely because he didn't want to make a show. And that, that's another difference, I think, often between uh, you know, what we see on television versus what we see in the Bible is there is no show. You know, they're not trying to draw attention to themselves. And in this case, he does it privately. He didn't want them to think that somehow he had done it by his own power that he had raised her from the dead. Well, after they were all put out, then he sought the Lord in prayer, looking to the Lord for his mercy towards this daughter of his and towards the people who were there because she played a very important role in that particular congregation, in that particular community. She was one who was ministering to those who had need. Now, last week we were reminded in Psalm 33, and I think this is so very important, that the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope for His loving kindness. Remember, loving kindness is another word for covenant mercy. 
these are the things that Jesus brings down to us. You know, the, 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 the mercies of God, all those mercies of God are all covenant mercies. They come through the covenant that essentially God has brought us into, that He has given Jesus as the guarantor or the one who guarantees these blessings. Uh, Jesus is the one who brings them down to us, and that's why we have them. But if we are to receive them, we have to hope in them. We have to hope for them. We have to look to the Lord, and that's what Peter was doing. If we don't ask, you are not going to receive, and if we, if we ask with wrong motives, we're not going to receive, and if we don't believe that God's going to give us you know, what He has promised He's going to give us in His loving kindness, we're still not going to receive. We have to hope in His covenant mercies, and that's what Peter was doing. He looked to the Lord for these mercies because of what he did through his son, and Peter wasn't disappointed. After he had prayed, he turned to, to uh, Tabitha and said, Tabitha, arise. And immediately she opened her eyes and sat up. He reached out his hand and raised her up and calling together the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And then we read in verse 42, it became known all over Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Even though they didn't see the miracle take place, they knew she was dead. And when they saw that she was alive, they knew a miracle had taken place. Now, again, notice the evidential power of a miracle. Now, I mentioned before, it's not that the miracle converts or changes the heart. As I pointed out in our meditation, there were many people, even the Pharisees, who saw the miracles of Jesus. Remember on the one occasion where Jesus cast the demon out of the demon-possessed man, and the Pharisees say he does that through the devil. They saw the miracle. And yet, they still rejected Jesus Christ. They only hated Him more because He was able to do a miracle. They hated Him more for raising Lazarus from the dead rather than saying, this proves that He's from God, we should listen to Him. Now, miracles don't convert, but they do draw attention. They draw attention to the fact that God is at work, that He is present, that He is doing the miracle. So that those <clears throat> who see the miracle will listen to what that person has to say and hopefully by God's grace be saved. Now again, that's how miracle functioned back in, in these days, um, but how, how do we use miracles today? Well, we do need to remember that our Lord isn't necessarily going to give us the power to do miracles today so that those who hear us will know that we're speaking God's Word. That's not how miracles work to confirm the word that we speak. We need to remember again that God has already confirmed the word the first time He gave it. And I'll remind you about you know, the case where the Roman church came to Calvin and they challenged Him to produce the miracles that prove that His teaching was actually from the Lord. Well, He opened His Bible and He pointed to those that are recorded there because He says, what we are teaching is the Bible and God has already authenticated the Bible through miracles here. And again, perhaps you've heard arguments as to, um, you know, does God always have to continue to do miracles, to continue to confirm a word that He's already confirmed? And what about the next generation who hasn't seen them? Does He have to continually do it? No, that's not how the Lord does it. He does it by doing it once. And then he records that, and these are the eyewitness accounts, and these are what we need to believe. So this is what we point to, the miracles that God used to confirm His Word. And again, as I mentioned before, we're going to see very soon in our series on apologetics, after R.C. gets through demonstrating the existence of God, that miracles are important to authenticate the Bible. Once we know God exists and once we know what He's capable of doing, we realize that the only way he can distinguish that somebody is speaking his word is by doing a miracle through that person to confirm it, something only he can do, and that's what a miracle is. By the way, everything that's taking place in the world today, what we call ordinary providence, the laws of nature and so forth, that's all the supernatural act of God as well. That's all a miracle as well, the fact that we even exist, the fact that we have all the gifts that we have, everything is, is miraculous in a certain sense. But what we mean by miracle here is that God does something that He doesn't ordinarily do. He, he goes above, as it were, or beyond uh, what it is that uh, the laws of nature will allow. 
I, I drop a rock and it goes up instead of down, or maybe I try to step onto the water and instead of going down into the water, I stay on top of the water. That's not the way things normally work, but that's how God draws attention. And only He is able to break, as it were, these laws of nature. So miracles are very important to apologetics. And by the way, that, that is to bringing a sound argument for these things. As R.C. will remind us, we're only, we're only called to prove that God exists, to prove that the Bible is His Word. We cannot persuade. That's something that we must leave up to God, and He ultimately persuades by His Holy Spirit. Now, finally, I want us to notice how the Lord was directing Peter through these events very briefly. <clears throat> First of all, He put concern in Peter's heart for the churches. This led him to Lydda where he healed Aeneas and he preached the gospel and many were converted. Those who were in Joppa, which was 10 miles away, heard what was done in, in Lydda and wanting Peter to heal Tabitha, and notice the providential timing of Tabitha's death while Peter was in, in Lydda. They called for him and when he did, when he came and he healed Tabitha, many more heard the gospel and were saved. Now we read at the end of this passage that he stays at the house of Simon the Tanner because the Lord is going to prepare him to reach out to the Gentiles. You know, up to this point, um, you know, we, we haven't, we don't really see um, a, a real outreach to the Gentiles, but the Lord prepares Peter, as we know through that vision, to receive the messengers that are going to be sent by Cornelius because an angel appears to Cornelius and says, go send to the house of Simon the Tanner for Peter because he's going to come and he's going to preach words to you that you need to hear. So the Lord is preparing Peter to begin to reach out now to these Gentiles. And let me just say that that was not unique to Peter. Okay, now the fact that these great things were taking place, that, that is unique. You know, those things don't happen very often today. But the fact that he was providentially guiding Peter, that's not unique to Peter. God is actually providentially guiding all of our lives today. Everything that happens in our lives happens because of God's will, because of his providential guiding. All the circumstances we're faced with, the people that we have to interact with, the events that take pl place in our lives... Even the temptations we have to face. That's why Jesus tells us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, lead a, do not lead us into temptation. Because the Lord allows us to be tempted for good purposes. So all of these things come about. Everything that comes into our lives, God is the one who is bringing them into our lives. Even the rain or the lack of rain for which, you know, brings a whole series of, of things that, that we have to interact with. But He brings them all for good purposes, doesn't He? It tests us, you know, at first we struggle, but He's helping us to overcome these difficulties. He's, he's bringing us into circumstances that we have to deal with in order to grow or to teach us new things we need to do, or He's bringing opportunities for us to be able to serve Him. So let's remember that God's guiding us as well. And when He sends a lesson, we need to learn from that particular lesson. When he sends an opportunity, we need to be ready, even as Peter was ready to get up and go. We need to be ready at all times to serve the Lord when he calls us to serve him. So may the Lord help us. May he help us to grow in these areas. Well, let, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's pray and ask the Lord to apply these things. <clears throat>